so I will give people one minute to get here. Yeah, one minute. Aren't you? Oh, no. All the way around. Never mind. Aren't I a professor? you got to wait like 20 minutes. That's, uh, being the son of one, that's not true. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a choir director, someone taught me, and it's very true, is that if you start late, then the people who come late just come later and later and later. So start on time. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So what was your father a professor of? Mathematics. Okay. John and Betsy said they'll be here in five minutes. Do we want to wait for them? You said one minute. They've been out a long time. I know, and they're they're both moving a little slow. I think I think we can cut them a little slack. Deborah's gonna sneak in the back door about seven, but okay. she's gonna listen online while she drives. Okay. So I'll unlock that for her. And what time is it that we normally break for a snack? It's right around it's seven, 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 seven fifteen. Seven, seven fifteen in that range. Yes. Okay, I just we don't have to move that time. I'm planning for her ice cream. I'm planning for my ice cream, but then oh. I need to take it off the counter at a certain time. Yeah, we can't move that time. That's good. Father, I have a question about last week. The book you recommended on uh, divine providence. What, who was that by? You you showed a Walter Chiswick. Father Walter. You read it to me. Is Father Walter Chiswick? Abandonment to Divine Providence is like C A S S A G E, I think is his name. Don't ask me how to say it because I have no um, idea. Well, you showed a, a code and said take a picture of it. That was divine. That was abandonment to Divine Providence. And I did, but I can't get it to work yes, to do okay. anything. So I was okay. Let me see. Did you see this window in the door? Of course, it's the heart window. It's the heart. That's it. It's right here. This is one yes. you recommended. Yes, and that's even the edition I like. It is? Yes. Okay. Back with us. Thanks. Good to Welcome be back. back. Good to be seen. We'll have to stop Good talking about you now. <laughs> oh, darn. I kept on listening to the show, yeah. trying to think if you guys were going to say anything about me, but you know, I couldn't pick anything. Up. <laughs> I, I muted we right did. before we did that. We did one week. I know we did, and I've been right bef like before we started. And, <laughs> but we were streaming. Some which way. <laughs> But then you usually cut it off at the end and say goodbye, everybody, and then mm -hmm. so I can't hear what you're saying after you cut off. So. Right. Oh. <laughs> I think All people are more comfortable offering their prayer intentions when I've got the oh, yeah. sound off or the broadcast off. No doubt. No doubt. Text telling me they can't read it. Okay. Sounds I need to bring my phone in with me. Oh, there's two more. Bearing. 
gift, or at least food, which is close enough. Yeah. And we should be here Thursday too for the Paris concert. Yeah. For your last one. Yep. Sad. <laughs> Actually, it is. We have a good parish council, so yeah. I'm hoping I have one as good where I'm going. <laughs> well, I know Hopedale oh, pretty well. Yeah. It's a nice little community. That, that Isaac Fury is kind of a problem. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I didn't mean that people at home. <laughs> <laughs> In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall do the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of your faithful, grant to that same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 If you have heard other versions of the prayer, they are wrong. That's the one Father Tzilla taught me in seminary, so it is by definition right. <laughs> So I don't want to scare people off, so I didn't use the D word earlier, but we are talking about discernment. <laughs> also scary is the E word, which is evangelization. <laughs> I don't have a slide on it, I just want to make sure I mention this. There is, what, there's a fancier phrase for it, but basically discernment paralysis, where you spend so much time to, trying to discern what you should do that you never actually do anything. Um, as uh, I, Mentor Father Brett ran in of I want to want you want fame. <laughs> says, Sometimes you have to put the car in gear and drive. That's a drive itself. You sit there, the, you can sit there on the curb and think, Should I go? Should I go? Should I go? And you have to take the next step. You don't have to ask the person out. You have to go to seminary, whatever it is. <laughs> Speaking of Father Brett, the most important thing on hearing the Holy Spirit. Are you not working? I want to want what you want. If we want to want what God wants, our hearts are in the right attitude for receiving what God sends us. Some of this, what we have here, we'll call them inspirations. Um, I'm not in love with the term just because I think it might lead us a little <coughs> astray from what's going on. But the fundamental thing is we want to hear what God asks of us. We want to do it. That's not saying we, there, we don't rebel at times. But we can't, you know, Obviously, no one's coming in on Tuesday night who's living the life of dissipation and drunken debauchery and all that good stuff. Uh, but you can't lead a life away from God and then expect the Holy to be able to hear the Holy Spirit well or accurately. The Holy Spirit is calling you back, and you can learn to do it. But the, if you really want to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life, you have to have that disposition. I want to want what you want. With the accent. With the accent. The Holy Spirit, <laughs> the Holy Spirit does not speak Midwest. He speaks Southern. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, wrote a lot on the, what he called discernment of spirits. And the way he put it was he talked about good spirit and bad spirit and how to discern which is which. Um, I don't know what he believed. I think most of us, including me these days, will say it's not always spirits prompting you. Every temptation does not actually come from an evil spirit prompting you, and every good spirit is not an angel whispering in your ear. You know, the good angel and the bad angel. It's, that's not necessarily how it works. But there are currents in our mind, for lack of a better word, and he wants us to understand how to follow the good, bad ones and the good ones, because the good ones in the end are coming from the Holy Spirit. So the good spirit is whatever leads you to God, and a bad spirit is what leads you away from God. Simple enough, but hard to tell, right? He talks a lot about consolation desolation. If you're on fire with God's love, you want to praise God, that's the spirit of consolation. So uh, sometimes we talk about the warm fuzzies, and it's not always the warm fuzzies. You can have a spirit of consolation, and maybe not even feel all that good about it. If you're living your spiritual life, so I want to feel good about it all the time, well, there's someone who's really good at counterfeiting good experiences, at least for a while, and you don't want to listen to them. So you want to be careful of that. Um, 
And we can experience desolation. God seems to be absent. We're the opposite of consolation. We're not feeling lifted up. We don't want to praise God. We don't want to do his works. We're in a spirit of desolation. That doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong. We'll get to that principle. But you have to be aware of these two states. In the end, God is always leading us to consolation, and the enemy is leading us toward desolation. So, Father, yeah. I have a question, and maybe you're going to answer it later on. <laughs> um, so, I, I go through what I call periods of darkness, where I want to do... Uh, I question. want to do it. Okay, I, I don't know if we'll get to it later, but necessarily not. It's a good question, but okay. it might fit in <coughs> later. Okay. Right. Um, and desolate, yeah. Uh, the, the saying goes is God comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Um, so if you get all full and satisfied yourself, God will start pricking at you. If you are troubled but I want to want what God wants, then he will work to comfort. Not immediately. Um, St. Ignatius had a very, very organized mind. Um, I do not. <coughs> but he wrote 14 rules on how you decide whether it's a good spirit or a bad spirit. Okay. So, first rule. So if we're talking about people who live a life of habitual mortal sin. The enemy, as he calls him, gives proposes to them a pair of pleasures. says, look what you can get by uh, shooting heroin or whatever it is. And they continue to imagine all of these things and it holds them trapped. Sin traps us. I, uh, it's, it's all over scripture, it's, it's a reality. People say, oh, I'm free, I can do whatever I want. No, I'm free if I can do what God wants. God, I'm God's slave. No, God makes you really you. It's a false opposition. But the enemy will say, look at all this cool stuff you can have. This is the world around us, by the way. Look at all the cool stuff you can have. And there's nothing wrong with cool stuff per se, but you can't place your, it will always betray you in the end. My old live in the hills history professor said, gentlemen, technology will always betray you. Even like, even like you know, basic computers, so. And the, these persons, the people go from mortal sin to mortal sin, the good spirit does the opposite thing, pricking and biting their consciousness to the process of reason. What this is saying is that, and I, uh, I don't know where I talk. Anyway, um, there's a certain level on which we know what is right and wrong, and not just in our hearts. Our minds know how we're created to work. And so if we are going from wrong thing to wrong thing to wrong thing, there's always that voice nagging at us, saying you're going in the wrong direction. You're going in the wrong direction. How does he know where we're going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to kind of quickly block it out, like, ah, yeah. no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and do whatever uh, I want to do. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Yeah. Planes, yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is actually a good example of they weren't listening to the voice of reason <laughs> telling them they're going the wrong way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> The second rule, vice versa. So this is people who are really working about trying on trying to be holy. Then for them, the evil spirit is the one who bites, saddens, and puts obstacles to quieting with false reasons that you may not go on. The devil's favorite tool for people who want to get holy is discouragement. One way or another saying, it's not worth it, you can't do it, look at all the good stuff you're giving up. The good spirit gives courage and strength, consolation, tears. You can cry over past sins. There's, there's something to that. Inspirations and quiet. Easing and putting away all obstacles that one may go on in well-doing. Uh, this far, it, I think it is relatively easy to see. Th th these th two rules are not that difficult to understand what's going on. God afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. And the enemy flips it the other way around. He comforts the comforter. He comforts the comfortable and even more afflicts the afflicted. Okay, so he's consolation. Here he actually gives his definitions, like a good mathematician, um, which I don't think he was a mathematician, but anyway, or a good philosopher, there we go. St. Ignatius uh, really hadn't studied any of this, and he really he seems to really have had deep inspirations of the Holy Spirit. When he started teaching, he irritated some people, ruffled some feathers, 
was actually reported to the Inquisition. They called him up and said, how can you, called them, not on the phone, called him on trial, said, how can you be teaching this stuff? And he said, well, here's what I teach. And they said, we can't argue with that. So anyway, he really did know what he was doing. And it seems that he learned it, a lot of it from his own very deep prayer and meditation. So consolation is some interior movement of the soul in which the soul comes to be inflamed with love of its creator. And so it loves no creative thing in and of itself. He's not saying we don't love creative things, but we don't love creative things as our goal in life. God put beautiful things in this life for a reason that they can lead us astray. We love them. St. Francis of Assisi is a great example. Oh, St. Francis loves animals. St. Francis loves animals because he saw the love of God at work in them, not for their own sake. And so that's the attitude St. Ignatius is talking about. St. Francis is one of St. Ignatius. Did you guys know St. Ignatius' conversion story? <coughs> I'm um, not sure. St. Ignatius started out, uh, he was a, his actual name is a, something like seven different Spanish names, Ignacio something. Um, you killed my father, prepare to die. And that actually, yeah. if you know that movie, that's Ignatius. Maybe not the drunken fool part of it, but that vainglory part of it. And so he uh, apparently cut a pretty wide swath through the ladies of the court and in the meantime worked uh, as a, I think it was actually in mercenary work. Um, and he was standing on the battlements of a fortress and a cannonball came through right here. Shattered his leg. He was taken prisoner ransom, taken to a house where they set his leg, but they set it wrong and they had to break it again and reset it without benefit of anesthetic, by the way. Mm. This came with a rather long convalescence, as you might imagine. And he was bored out of his mind. And so he said, do you have something for me to read? And he said, well, you know, I really like books about King Arthur and the Round Table, that kind of thing, Knights Errant. That's how he always pictured himself. Like, my name is, oh, Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare <laughs> to die. Can you read that far? It is Inigo Lopez de Oñas y Loyola. I think it's actually longer <laughs> versions of it than that. Oh, okay. Um, so he asked a book like that. He said, we don't have anything like that. We just have these lives of the saints and the life of Christ. And you can just about there, what? For, but he was so bored out of his mind, he started reading them. And what he noticed was when he read the lives of the saints, uh, when he read the other stuff, you know, like, oh, this is a good story, just the way, the lives of the saints stuck with him. And he started saying, you know, why can't I be the kind of saint that St. Francis was, or St. Dominic was, or whoever? Why can't I be someone who follows Christ? And Ignatius, as he became known in religious life, was never one to do something halfway. If he was going to be a rapscallion, he was going to be the darndest rapscallion he could be. And if he was going to be a saint, he was going to be the saintiest saint he could be with the grace of God. Um, he went on a retreat. He spent, uh, I think, literally months in a cave trying to recall every single sin he had committed throughout the course of his life to that point. Mm -hmm. He then made an appointment with a priest to make a general confession. It took more than one day. You do not need to do this. I want to make everyone clear. <laughs> But that was Ignatius. He was, if he was going to do it, he was not going to do it halfway. So um, he then started attracting men to follow him in, his, in this uh, way of life. And what he originally wanted to do was go to the Holy Land. But he said, if we can't do that, after a year, we'll take that as a sign from God, and we'll go ask, and we'll do the Pope, whatever the Pope wants. Well, they didn't go to the Holy Land, and the Jesuits have been, at least officially, uh, they take a vow of obedience, fourth vow of obedience to the Pope in a special way. Uh, sometimes they tend to do what they think the Pope should have told them to do, and what, he, what he actually said, but that is at least the idea. So as part of this whole process then, he really had to think about what had been going on in his life, what led him to conversion, how did he know what to do, how did he not know what to do, and he boiled them down into these 14 rules. You all ready to go? 14 rules. Pam. Was it originally called Jesuit or Society of Jesus? They actually, we call them Jesuits, names? but their actual name is their actual name is Society of Jesus. And so S J is Jesuit. They just added that other name. Jesuit is short, short. It's not official. It's just a short word for it. Oh, okay. Um, and actually, in Spanish, I think it's the Company of Jesus. So sometimes you'll run into Jesuits who call the Order the Company, which is interestingly also what CIA people call the CIA. I don't <laughs> think there's a connection. But <laughs> <laughs> 
I had a classmate in seminary who had been a civilian defense analyst, but we always said he'd actually been a spy, and so he was going to be in charge of RCIA, <laughs> <laughs> Roman R Catholic R Intelligence yeah. Agency. <laughs> oh my God. So anyway, consolation, moving you toward God and loving no created thing uh, except as it exists in God. So it doesn't say don't love anything, but just we love it, you know, love people, God puts them in our lives, but realize they're in God's love. Um, also, shed tears that move to love of us, Lord. When we are overcome by sin or sense of sin, uh, we don't need to dwell on that, but we need to recognize that is actually a spirit of consolation because it is moving us directly to God's service and praise. We will our sinfulness, but also God's forgiveness. That's the passion of the Christ our Lord. Consolation is everything that increases faith, hope, and charity. All interior joy, which calls us to heavenly things. So if you're like, Father, I'm not really good at loving everything only in God. Well, are you at least growing in faith, hope, and charity? Are you calling attention to heavenly things and salvation of souls? That's consolation. Big sign of consolation, by the way, this overlaps a lot with some of the other stuff I've done with Father Philippe, is that peace. And this is going to come back up again. Consolation gives you peace a true peace, a lasting peace. The devil loves to upset. And that's this morning, for everyone who's actually awake for that, um, Jesus says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. So that's a gift of the Spirit. So now you're, of course, wondering, then how does he define desolations? That's the fourth rule. Everything that fo everything's the contrary to the third rule. Darkness of soul, disturbance in it, movement to things lowly and earthly, unquiet of different agitations and temptations. Your soul's always turbulent. Um, and this is very important later on. Uh, want, not, not trusting in God without hope, without love. Lazy, tepid, sad, as if separated. Don't see this as if. Separated from his creator and Lord. Um, so consolation and desolation are opposites to each other. And so the thoughts that come from consolation are the opposite of thoughts that come from desolation. And all this is all abstract, but it really does, I think, fit together and make sense. The fifth rule. I can short it down a little here. In time of desolation, never make a change in spiritual practices. We had a saying in February in, in seminary, never discern out of seminary in February. <laughs> it's dark yeah. and it's cold, <laughs> and everything you can play on a sense of the end, you're like, oh, it's we're barely started second semester. <laughs> is everything that can wear you down is there. But it's more important when that sense of spiritual desolation, when you feel lost from God, the temptation is to shake things up. Um, to a certain degree, if you really, 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 really are confident you're overdoing something, you could cut back on it. But don't say, this prayer is not working. I'm not going to do it anymore. Okay. Sounds odd, but don't do it. So how does that differ from the dark night of the soul? That's... Michelle's question, okay. which isn't technically in here, but it's a good one, so we'll get back to it. You're, 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 you're going to remind me at the end, right? Yeah. Okay. So when you're in desolation, be firm and constant in the resolutions and determinations which you were before the desolation arrived. Okay. Consolation is the good spirit who guides and counsels us. In desolation, it is the bad. You cannot trust your instincts, your feelings, or anything else when, you're, when you are in that state of desolation. Remember, back to desolation is attempting to tempt you away from God. So if the choices that you made when you were in a good state need to endure while you're in desolation. Um, it's not a, perhaps an absolute iron rule, but do not abandon anything easily. Um, I've talked about it in other contexts. You know, If you sin and you fall into a state of desolation, you need to pick up your prayer life right as if nothing whatsoever had happened. Are there levels of desolation? Probably, probably. <laughs> yeah. um, one name you will probably want to go home and Google is Dan Burke, who does a lot of work on spiritual direction. He, just, he has a blog where he discusses these in more detail than I do. Is that Burke with an E? B-U-R-K-E, yeah. Spiritualdirection.com or org, but don't type that in because then you, if you get the wrong one, you'll end up at who knows where. <laughs> Google for Dan Burke, uh, Ignatius, and you'll find it. Um, so never make important decisions if you can avoid it in a time of desolation. Even when you're trying to just determine what's right and wrong, what should I do, what should I do? And there are times when you, you, you know, you're in desolation, but there's a medical emergency or something, you have to make the best decision you can then and there. 
but in general, you want to avoid making major, major decisions in a spirit of desolation because it's not God working on you effectively. Do change some things. Don't change your first resolution. So if you say, I'm going to pray daily, um, and you can, you can nip and tuck around that a little, but pray more. Meditate more. Um, we're talking more about the examine, and just, in fact, that's the next slide, and giving ourselves more scope and some suitable way of doing penance. Because remember, desolation is pulling us toward things of the earth, and so doing a penance pulls you away from that. What St. Ignatius is saying here is actively move against what the desolation is trying to get you to do. Very, very hard to do, especially if you're in a nasty state of desolation. He talks about the examination. I'll just throw this here. And if I, I, I'm almost going to print this for Janie, but I didn't quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, do this every night, or something similar to this. St. Ignatius said, I believe, if I remember this correctly, is that if you were faithful to this, it would be hard to go too wrong in your life. Um, there's a bit of a problem with it that I'll get to just for people like me. But number one, place yourself in God's presence and give thanks for God's great love for you. That's, uh, although we don't often think of it when we sign the cross at the beginning of prayer, that's what we're doing. We're invoking God's presence upon us, invoking the most holy trinity. Um, you can give thanks for God's love for you. Pray for the grace to understand. God wants to give us all kinds of graces but we don't always remember to ask for them or make use of them. Review your day. What you're doing is you're looking for movements of good spirit, bad spirit throughout the day. Um, Ignatius himself was a passionate man. And I don't mean that necessarily in the sense of unholy passions. He was just, like I said, didn't throw himself in anything halfway. Um, most of the time, I'm on pretty much an even keel. So if I'm going through, I'm trying to find a high light of day, the high will be here and the low light will be there. Needs to think, highlight here, low light here. But you're trying to identify those moments in the day when you really felt like God was working with you, God was giving you, you know, His Spirit was with you. Um, that moment when you were really, you knew you were going to be rude to somebody, you were rude anyway, because you were feeling grumpy. You know, just recognize those moments in the day. Reflect on what you did, said, or thought in those instances. Were you drawing closer to God or further away? Because if you were drawing closer to God, that was good spirit. Good spirit and quotations, consolation. You know, I was going to make you guys have a twiz today, did you? <laughs> consolation. I'm not sure we went. Quotation, yeah. 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 And like, like so if, there, if the experience is drawing you away, because one of the things that you need to learn, I, if, by the way, when we're done with this, we're going to look at Father Philippe's version, which is a little less technical. Um, but one of the things you need to learn is how it is that God acts in your life. When he's giving you inspiration, what does it look like, sound like, feel like? And so you're looking back over your day saying, I think this was God at work. This seemed like a good idea at the time, but boy, I, yeah, I'll come on to other. I realized that was not God at work. That was the spirit of desolation at work. So you're going over that. Then look toward tomorrow. Um, be as specific as you plan on something that you might do tomorrow to cooperate more effectively with God's plan. I can really struggle with this. Um, but see if you can find something that you will do tomorrow to work with God, including the Our Father. It's not complicated. Um, if it takes, I mean, it, it, some people might take half an hour at it, but don't think, oh, I did it in five minutes, I'm doing it wrong. No. The important thing, I want to want what you want. Okay? And so you're asking God, help me understand how to see what you want in my life. Help me to see how I'm cooperating or not cooperating with what you ask for in my life. Does it Compline try to do all of that? Compline has an opportunity for that. And that's often, usually when I do it. Compline is a night prayer for, any, uh, for anyone who doesn't do that. We do our liturgy of the hours. There's the prayer that you pray somewhere shortly before you go to bed usually. And it includes that chance to look over your day. And I really, really do just, I don't care if you pray Compline or not, I really do encourage you to do this. Hold on. The seventh rule. This is Ignatian wording, and I don't know how much this is, just him in translation. The idea, as best as I can get it, is 
If you're in desolation, the Lord is leaving you to your natural powers. In order, and you always will have the divine help to resist whatever is coming to you, but you may not realize it. Um, you have enough, but for some reason, it's been taken away. <laughs> That's your point. Where was doing a talk? Was it here? No, it was at, uh, some, some, something I was doing at Central, I don't remember why. Um, but every time we would have a major liturgy at the Mount, the grounds crew would choose, you know, we had a bishop from somewhere doing something. The grounds crew would choose then to mow the grass outside the chapel, <laughs> inevitably. I think eventually someone in the seminary wised up and started communicating with the grounds crew, please do not mow on Tuesday morning or whatever it was. Um, so yeah, this one baffles me just a little bit. I, I think the point is, if you're in desolation, don't think God has abandoned you. He is there, you don't perceive him and he's letting you perceive how inadequate your own natural abilities are because nobody can do this on their own. If you think, Father, I'm horrible at this, congratulations, so is everybody else. Take grace. <laughs> okay. Eighth rule. This is the hard one. You thought that last one was bad. If you're in desolation, be patient. Um, you will soon be consoled, and in the meantime, Six rule back here, pray more, meditate more, make sure you're diligent in your exam and maybe find, examine and find some suitable penance. Okay, so be patient. If you really wanna get even with someone, pray for the Lord to grant them patience because he'll give them plenty of opportunities to practice. The ninth rule. So you're saying, why is it then that we find ourselves desolate? The first one really is our own fault. Don't be too anxious to assume this is it. But if you know that you really have just been totally blowing off your prayer, uh, don't care what's going on, uh, oh, I'll go to Mass if I feel like it, oh, I don't feel like praying today. That's different from sometimes people talk about I'm going through the motions with prayer. Um, that will happen. It's persistence in doing your best to pray that counts, not necessarily uh, the feeling of, oh, I mean every single word of this heartfelt. People drive yourself nuts trying to do that. One of the things that sent C.S. Lewis into atheism for a while is he was trying to pray the Our Father and felt that he had to vividly feel the meaning of each and every clause of it and he couldn't do it and concluded he couldn't pray and just gave up on it. I don't think that's what St. Ignatius is after. St. Ignatius is like, oh, I can't be bothered or I'm going to rush through this as soon as possible because I want to be doing something else. That's what he's talking about. The second one is I think what the eighth rule is actually getting at was to let us see how much we, uh, to see if we're willing to continue in God's service and praise even if, it don't, even if we don't feel good about it. Stretching us out. Oh, sorry, the third one's the one that goes to the back one. The third one is that we can know that we, it is not ours to get or keep great devotion. So if you think, well, if I only tried harder, I would love God better. St. Ignatius is saying, no, it doesn't work that way. I'm not saying, oh, don't try to love God, but it is by the grace of God that we love him better, and sometimes we just need to be reminded by that. To say, look at what a wonderful prayer person I am and how grace-filled I am. You are, and sometimes you will encounter a desolation to remind you of that. So we may not, I like, we may not build a nest in a thing not ours. We don't say, look at what a wonderful person I am, all these things God, I'm not, not like this poor uh, tax collector over there. No, raising our intellect into some pride or vain glory, attributing to us devotion to other things of spiritual consolation. All those good feelings and we think, look at what I have managed to achieve. Sometimes we get desolation back of that uh, to remind us we didn't achieve that. Having dealt with depression myself, I do wonder how it plays out in this. And I, I did skim through some of uh, Dan Burke's stuff and it is uh, sometimes hard to tell which is which. And I also think sometimes depression can serve to, as, as uh, desolation. Thank you, <laughs> as desolation. And we can read the benefit. Why does God allow us to experience these things? Because we can draw some benefit from it. And it might be, you know, in my case, maybe that was one of, in fact, I know for a fact, this is one of the ways of God getting my attention. Like, can you come some other way, Lord? Nope, this is the best one for you. Abandonment to divine providence, right? So, 
10th and 11th rules. So if you're in consolation, don't get fat and happy. Thank God for it, but realize that you are being consol given consolation so that when the next round of desolation comes, you will be ready for it. Um, St. Therese, the, one of our back statues, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know about her final year or so of life? She was dying of tuberculosis, which they could not treat, and it was intensely painful. She was literally choking on her own blood. Her, uh, her lungs were filling with it. She was in pain, and she felt, even though she knew better, even as if God had abandoned her. She wasn't sure that she was not damned. Um, and this often does happen. Mother Teresa, you might recall, had some of the same things going on in her life. Um, she take it, hold on to that experience of consolation, even in those dark times. They knew that those feelings were not true. Have you built up a store of consolation? So if you're consoled, don't puff yourself up. Lower yourself as much as you can, reminding yourself that you are not ready for the next bout of desolation on your own whenever it shows up, and it will show up. Because remember, even if you're doing things right, you get that desolation as the reminder not to get too full of yourself. If you're in desolation, you have grace sufficient to resist it. You have everything you need. Lord, I don't feel like this. I don't. Where's your grace? Where's your grace? It is there. It might be hard to receive, and yeah, we're going to actually get to dessert break easily or early, which I want to get everyone happy. Um, just from a desolation, God has not abandoned you. He's given you plenty of grace. When the time is right, He will bring you out of it. I don't think I got it in here, by the way, but there is nothing wrong with asking to be taken out of a state of desolation. Like, Lord, I can't deal with this anymore. You don't have to do it in consolation, but can I at least get you know, back to the middle? You can ask that. Be careful of asking for excessive uh, consolation, because I said there's someone who's more than willing to counterfeit that for a while for you. But you can certainly ask to come out of desolation. Pam? Um, I'm curious if anybody else experience, has ever experienced this, or if there's a good answer. Like sometimes I feel like I go through the motions of prayer, mm -hmm. Like it's a chore instead of getting closer to God. It's just like, okay, and so I just got to do goal. this. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to <laughs> check him off. I don't want to just like and then put him in this little box. Like, okay, now I'm going to do my day. Yeah, that's I fight that a lot. Yeah, um, that that is, if not a full fledged spirit of desolation, at least it's there. And so you're doing what Saint Ignatius says to do in desolation. You're praying anyway, right? Yeah, Sometimes but I don't feel very. I don't care what you feel. Sorry, that was harsh. That's my pastoral side coming out. I know, it's not about um, yeah. Our breviary that all priests pray every day in religious, right. I would lie to you if I said it's not sometimes tedious. But at least I know when I'm praying that. I'm praying that in union with the whole church. And so I have that to look forward to and to buoy me. Are there still are there times when I'm like, I want to go see what birds are at my bird feeder now. <laughs> um, but I have to learn. Just to be patient with, with it, to deal with it, and like, Lord, you just got the most distracted side of me. And he says, I know, but you were here. You were trying. You were working at it. So distraction in prayer, dryness in prayer. God can give you that grace of attention if he wants to. If not, your doubts keep showing up. Okay, has anybody else ever experienced that? Everybody just yes. has. Yes. Oh, yes. no, never. <laughs> All part of the deal. You're holy. You're so yeah, holy. Right. Good for you. Pretty it's calm. part of the prayer experience. <laughs> Um, we talk sometimes even not just about consolations but sensible consolations that feel like boy I am really praying today and it's going really well and that can be correct but just realize that's a gift God has given you for today and if you're praying so I can keep getting that feeling one of the reasons we have that dryness in prayer is God does not want us praying to him and loving him because we always feel good about it I call that the church of the holy endorphin <laughs> <laughs> Um, and some of our uh, various, not all Protestants by any stretch of the imagination, but some of the ones whose uh, worship services does have everybody jumping up and on clapping. You know what jumping down and clapping does? It releases endorphins. No wonder you feel good. <laughs> um, my, my hero, Rich Mullins, and I think you guys at least know of him, Barry mm -hmm. Stu, um, was, gave, he you know, gave concerts, and at least for me, what he said between the songs is even more important. But he said a woman came up to him after one concert and said, Rich, the Holy Spirit was really moving in there tonight. 
He said, how could you know? It was way too noisy. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to distinguish that endorphin release. You know, God can give us endorphin releases for good reasons, but that's not a sure sign of the presence of the Spirit. By the way, cut to the chase, there are no sure signs. We can do the best we can. Twelve through fourteen are examples that are really verbose and kind of confusing. I think what it boils down to is the bad spirit tends to flee when we resist. Um, which counterpoint, obviously, is if we keep giving into the temptations of the bad spirit, it's going to hang around. The bad spirit does not want things brought to light. The devil hates the light. Um, more people need to come to confession. The bad spirit whispers to a lot of people, "You don't need to go to confession." Even venial sins need to come to confession. Are you required? I mean, can they be forgiven outside of confession? Sure they can. Um, can you just tell God in your heart what you've done wrong? Yes, you can. But there is a reality, and that's confession is something that you just put in, that's not just me making it up, is bringing it to light in a context where you know you are encountering Jesus in a very real and particular and special way. Finally, know your weaknesses. Be honest with yourself, because the devil knows your weaknesses. Um, so you have to know, where, when, when I mess things up, what got to me, how it impacted me, and guard against that. Um, you have the grace of God, you're going to win, but you have to know what it is. If you don't know what will get you, it's something they hammered to us in seminary, but it's true for everyone. You know, uh, One senior Wallace used to say, the devil dances on the roofs of seminaries. He wants to get in, and if you don't know where he's going to lure you, you're very, very vulnerable to it. We have what's called, I'm warning off topic, but that's okay. We'll, I'll give you chocolate in a minute, so I'll be fine. Um, our, most of us have what's called the predominant fault. When you sin, usually it's something in one particular way uh, in which you're being drawn away regularly. And you can ask Jesus to help see what that is. Um, when you're distracted in prayer, if your thoughts always turn to one particular thing, that can be a sign of what your predominant fault is. Um, when you sin, is it always a certain temptation that gets to you? That can be a sign of what your predominant fault is. But whatever it is, you need to know. When, when you said that the devil dances on the seminary, yeah. on the roof, yeah. I always felt like the devil takes more joy when he can get a good person to sin. Absolutely. Rather than those yeah. of us who are, well, I say those of us, yeah rather than the average person who's trying really hard. Um, but to get a saint to sin or to get a seminarian or a priest to sin is, boy, they really dance on the road. <coughs> Corruptio optimi pessima. Yes. The corruption of the best is the worst. See, it's well known enough, there's actually a Latin phrase for it. <laughs> so, yeah, Pam. But also, like, coming out of confession or or being in confession, you don't that often, or mm -hmm. I don't that often have consolation. I mean, yeah. it's it's like yeah. I take it, I receive it, but it's not like, oh, I feel so yeah. much better. I don't have that. What am I, what am I about to what am I about to say, Pam? I don't care. It is no, that well, if you were a bigger sinner, your feelings don't matter. <laughs> 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 um, I can count on. I think literally on fingers of one hand the number of times I've had that feeling come out. My first confession was definitely one of them, and only a few times after that. Um, it's just the no, but the knowing is the part. The that's knowing is the yeah. Yeah. Again, God doesn't want you going to confession because you'll feel better afterwards. It's great if you do. He wants you going because he wants to restore that relationship with him. And I just trust that, like, all these graces come tumbling down upon do. me they as do. I walk out of this. Yeah. Yeah, all, all, the, all the angels are clapping. And, um, <laughs> the that. former DRE at St. Mark's School, I don't know if it was a secret story I'm telling. Uh, she told me enough times, so I'll go with it. Um, all, they would take all the grade school kids over to confession, and so we would work our, once a week, we'd get each grade level. And she was there when one teacher was saying, now we're going over confession, but you know, it's not, not that important if you go, so go if you only really think you need to. And she, I don't know if she said, or if the priest when they got there said the opposite, said go, 
she's four she hears the whistle no <laughs> and she may well have been right um, so yeah the devil hates confession because weakest points it forces you among other things to own up these are my weaknesses these where I stumble this is where I stumble and fall and now the word we've all been waiting for <laughs> Great. <laughs> The previous themes just weren't turning out well with him. It's hard for a squirrel to be angry here. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you move and you take that feeder, that squirrel's going to be angry. Just so well, you know. Oh, yeah. Have you, have oh, you seen what they do when they, when their food supply disappears? They are not happy. So Father Derek is probably going to be calling you <laughs> I, I could with leave. no consolation in the call. I could, I could leave the uh, squirrel feeder back here because he put the ears of corn on it. So. You might want to leave a couple of ears of corn in the background. Detailed transition instructions. Oh, I've seen squirrels go to windows. Oh, he, he knocks on the window. Well, and so they'll, they'll just really? keep it up, yes. but there's no food. <laughs> That's funny. I have a couple squirrels. Where are you at? Down. Where are you at, Father? Yep. Where's my food? I can't figure out what's He's never gotten food from inside. I, never I don't know what he's looking for, but. Huh. I hear it rapping out there and I go look. JP, get away from the window. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I had this little guy run into my window this morning before I went to Mass. Mm -hmm. oh, they do that. Oh, yeah. And, um, Bird. No, it's a, a bird. 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 I, think it's a, I think it's a fox sparrow. It's a, an unusual, but yeah. got size in that. Uh, Let me get this right. You put a blanket over it? Yeah, because they need it. You don't want something else attacking it, and it, then it's quiet, and it's, that's what I understand. You're supposed to, I've, cardinals that have hit my window, I've done that, and they, uh, yeah. they've flown off. They, Are they special? Oh, you get this bird? Huh? It, 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 it flew into her window. It flew into the window. I'm finally glad I finally got a picture of my red-breasted grosbeak. The females came through earlier, and I got pictures of them on my feeder, with the veils just started showing up, and I'm, my webcam is catching them. Do you have any feeder. Orioles yet? Any I haven't seen any Orioles. Last year, at one time in my yard, I could count 15 of them in my tree. And usually they come for the hummingbirds, but I have hummingbirds now. I have a friend in Bloomington who just posted her first Oriole picture. It must just be rather late this yeah. year, I guess. Because I love them. My, my downy woodpeckers so remain regular customers. Yeah. yeah. And the finches. I assume you've got a home over there in Hopedale? Delavan is where we were. Delavan? Yeah. So it's Delavan and Hopedale? Yeah. Both? Yeah. Okay. Officially, Hopedale is a mission of Delavan, but actually, Hopedale is bigger national center. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, we know Hopedale pretty well. Yeah. Delavan, uh, Hopedale's got that big medical center. Yes. Yeah. 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 They sure do. They, that's a growing medical center over there. The well, one of the doctors that started that, man and wife, both doctors came from Conical and went to Hopedale. Because that was that's when I had to have school. Um, Betsy remembers. He was really good. He did Betsy's uh, cancer surgery. Betsy, what was the name of that doctor we had in Pontiac that went to Hopedale? Kind of started. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Let me think he and his that. wife both. Yeah. She's a, she's a pediatrician. But oh, you he did your cancer that. surgery. And I was trying to figure out. He's in my gallbladder. Yeah. Well, he's
Thanks for the beer float. Done this week? What you got? Indiana was prepared? What's that? You got something left in Indiana? Yeah. 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 They had that one done. Oh, they got that. Right? They got my cranial No, that's my friend Teresa. Four things. <laughs> Suddenly, my rain gauge said two inches. King Reeds are live around the corner. Place. So we got three and a half. Yeah. I don't think it got up, up to two down here. I went back and checked the rain gauge in my garden. Well, I don't know what happened to the digital one. <laughs> Frederick said Randolph said they got four and a half. Thank you. Thank you very much. Four ten, so we'd be right at four. Lightning Cam really yeah, had an opportunity to right. show us the <laughs> Lightning Cam. <laughs> I have a iPad with a lightning recording feature on it that pops up in the office window. That's a really spectacular shot. Oh, well, you had a pretty good time. Did, you didn't hear the beginning of the live stream. You guys are done? So it's like time to start. Yeah, we finished Friday. I think everybody in our area finished that one and two. I'm doing a lot of guys going the week before the two, or some guys, not many. You finished everything Friday? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, we had all the beans done in April. Wow. <laughs> we ran. We ran no, four. We ran four pretty hard days. Got all four done. Yeah. yeah. It was okay in the ground though. Father, I don't mean to have my back to you. That's okay. We we'll start talking. I'll move again. All right. <laughs> Father, you'll have to come back in the fall so you can write in the combine for harvest. I'm sure people in Delvin have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, oh, they don't own a farm over there. <laughs> <laughs> I hear some of them even work with a consultant on doing better farming over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're training some of them, coaching them up a little bit. So it's a nice community. Yep. They have a nice exercise facility in Hopedale. Yes, they do. And a park where the kids like to go and play softball. They all fun. Got a really nice hospital medical center. I was talking to a wife this afternoon, so. Hopedale. Oh. Saw my pair of people there. Got a good, good Ford dealership in Delvin. Yeah.
John, do you know Father Joe Baker that used to be at Epiphany? I the met him at, at uh, oh, the party, Jessica's party. He's he's taking he's going to be head of all Pontiac. He's really? Fourteenth in the Quad Cities of Pontiac. Really? Because mm -hmm. Father Adam is taking yeah. Father Jerry Ward, who's retiring, his spot at Morton. Okay. So Father Joe's coming down to Pontiac. Wow, I, I didn't know that. He asked for prayers. He's like, there's a lot of stuff going on in Pontiac. <laughs> a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. Father Sears actually never moved. He didn't. Where did he live? As priest. He was an assistant there and then and then pastor and has never moved. Wow, so he's been there a while, yeah. I guess. Wow. Pontiac? Yeah. And he's one of the bicycler guys, priests, right? Yep. Pontiac priests have to take care of the prison? I don't know if they were shared on the Facebook. They, uh, they had one of their own um, at one yeah, time. They had, a, Lincoln, did. Um, they had a chaplain I don't, I don't. who was in charge of the oh, hospital and the prison, prison. prison. Cause years ago. I don't know now. Yeah, true. Pam said that Father Rossi's going to Pontiac. We met him at Jessica's Father Cesaric. party. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, he's leaving, Father Adam. Right. And Father Joe Baker is going That's to Pontiac. Right. He has Andalusia and Milan right now, if that's right. I don't know. But the parish priest is staying, Father David? Yes. Oh, okay. So will he be an assistant? He already is. Oh, Father David will stay the assistant. Right. Oh, I see. He's, he's Why winding down to retirement age and yeah. doing fine. So. I thought he I was the was parish priest. He was, and then he, no he and Father Cesar switched. Switched? Okay, here we go. We're looking for him. Here it is. It's Dr. Crail. Crail. Yeah. Crail. P R O E H L. Yeah. Um, these are from Father Philippe's book, In the School of the Holy Spirit. Which, of course, you should read. Um, I have to say, after a while, his books do start to tend to cover even, start covering the same ground over and over. But the interior, the, the searching for and maintaining peace, interior freedom, and the school of the Holy Spirit are sort of, I call them the basic uh, ministry survival kit. Um, and they might be a basic life survival kit, too. So, um, I want to want, do you want, right? Put another way, the greatest obstacle on the path to holiness may be to cling too closely to the image we have our, of our own perfection. We think we know what we should be like, and we're not willing to let God tell us what we should be like. Um, I call this probably unfairly sort of the Catholic mom blog syndrome, because some of the Catholic mom blog, blogs you could read say, oh, this is my life at all, and then I'm not trying to run anybody down, but you say, oh, you know, I should, I should have Twelve children who all wake up in the morning and dress themselves and teach each other calculus type of thing. Um, not real life. But we can think, oh, I see these pictures that people, without like that, that's sort of what I said is mean. They're not doing it intentionally to mislead, but we all, the Facebook thing, very rarely do we actually put our real selves entirely on Facebook because we're not going to do that. And so we can think, oh, well, you know, all my friends are always doing these cool things on Facebook and I'm sitting <laughs> on my bird feeder looking at squirrels or something. <laughs> um, your image of your perfection has, might not have too much to do with what God's image of the perfect you looks like. Obviously, if you're thinking, oh, well, I need to stop sin being sinful, yes, that is correct. But in positive terms, back up just a second. Um, so some of you at least are gardeners, right? So let's say that you look at your garden and it has a bunch of weeds in it, okay? So the garden is your life and the weeds are sin. And you spend all your time pulling up weeds. What do you have? You do not have a garden. You have a bare patch of dirt. You want to be having a positive direction. What kind of garden are you trying to grow? And what this is saying is sometimes we can be trying, trying to grow a vegetable garden when God wants a flower garden vice versa. 
or that for some reason God wants you to grow asparagus, which I don't know what God would ever do with asparagus. <laughs> <anymore. Taste laughs> <Taste good. laughs> Actually, it's wonderful, especially but like long skinny asparagus and fried and with sauce on it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can eat that. Butter. Butter. Giant, giant mushies. Like giant mushies. Oh, the, the, the cabbage family in general, I'm not a big friend yeah. of. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the idea of them being, if the idea of our perfection is simply being sinless, that's not it. Sinless is a negative thing. Our perfection is a positive thing, but we can have a wrong idea of what that positive thing looks like. We need God to tell us what it is. Oh. I want to want what you want, whatever that may be. We say, Lord, I try to please you and I fail. I cannot do what you want. You know why that is? Very often, God doesn't, we have this idea like, I'm going to do this great thing for God and he's going to come in and bless it. God only gives you the grace to do what he asks you to do. So if you're heading off in your own direction, say, God, why aren't you helping me do this? I didn't tell you to do that in the first place. Okay. God grants what he commands. God will never, in fact, Bishop said this at confirmation, and he said it again in our Catholic schools mass is God never says go do this good luck tell me how it went <laughs> good luck. he's always there with I'm paraphrasing him a little bit but he feels very close to that's what he said <clears throat> okay. so when we profit we make good use of an inspiration the Lord sends he sends another and thus our Lord continues his graces as long as we continue to profit from them that's St. Francis de Sales quoted by Father Philippe the point here again being the more we cooperate with God the more help we get. If we're constantly not making use of what we believe to be inspirations of God, and again, I'm not getting inspired, oh, oh, I should do this, just this little, often these little <coughs> nudges. Um, if we're not making use of them, we'll at least become harder to discern, and we may miss them entirely. Do not turn that around and think, oh, every little nudge was that God, was that God, was God. Um, but if you're pretty confident that the Lord is asking something of you, and you're just repeatedly not doing it, well, then no wonder that after a while, you can't hear him very well. I've heard stories, and this has never happened to me, but like a priest <coughs> in the hospital, and I think they went to floor one, and for some reason they just think they need to press floor three, and they walk right by the room with somebody who's dying and needs a priest. If the Holy Spirit wants to do it with me, he can, but it hasn't happened yet. But that's a, as, as, if I really thought, if I was the elder, I thought, no, the Holy Spirit, I think, really wants me to press three, and I press three. Is anything going to go, unless three is a, like a closed door or something, otherwise... You know, is anything going to go wrong if I walk in the hall and nothing happens? No. Say, well, I guess that wasn't the Holy Spirit, but I was trying, and that's the key thing. How do you open yourself up to receive inspirations? Nice little type, So, because I know Pam really likes small type things. <laughs> Number one, be grateful for the graces you already have. I talk all the time about how important it is to be thankful to God. If you don't say thank you for the graces he's already giving, why is he going to give you more? Okay. <clears throat> Ask for them. He has this little prayer that I really like. Inspire me in all my decisions and never let me neglect any of your inspirations. Most decisions, actually, you don't need to mull over too much. Um, does God care too much what you wear when you go out? As long as you're dressed appropriately, no, probably not. Um, I mean, we I probably should I wear black most of the time. But actually, you know, if I'm going out, you know, if I'm going to the zoo on a hot day, I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I'm not wearing black, sorry. And that's okay, that's a decision I could make. Um, but if I thought, wait a second, you know, I just got this feeling somebody needs to see a collar today, then I would do it. Monsignor Brownsley, one of my pastors, said that one of the reasons he wears his clerical garb out a lot, which I, I tend to do unless I'm gonna be sweating like a thing, but someone who sees me has thought about Jesus today. They might have had a good thought about it, but they've had a thought about it. Resolve. That's, and that's true. Yeah. Resolve to refuse God nothing. To obey him in all things, big and small. And usually we have to start with the small. God doesn't start by saying, I need you to go do this big project for me. He starts by saying, I just need you to do uh, the day by day things, <laughs> the little things. 
when you already know what God wants, and most of the time, do you have a big, uh, you know, most of the time God wants you to come to Mass, pray regularly, you know, not run over the pre person in the grocery store who just cut in front of you, who's probably <laughs> me because I've been impatient. <laughs> um, <coughs> not hard to do. Do those things. And do them in a spirit of trust and obedience. Say, Lord, I know if she gets the last thing of Cheerios, it'll be okay. I'll get the generic ones instead. <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> Overlap from last week. Abandonment to divine providence. If God keeps saying, I'm trying to send you in this thing and you aren't listening because you don't trust me, you're not going to hear it. Be detached from our possessions, our ideas, our point of view. We have to be willing to be wrong. Not wrong about Jesus, not wrong about the faith, but wrong about darn near everything else. Um, I harp on this too much, but I'll do it anyway. We have to be willing to say that maybe our political views in one way or another are wrong. Maybe God is calling us to something else. I would say that to a room full of Democrats. I would say that to a room full of Republicans. I would say that to a room full of independents. Um, in America, in this era, it seems to me very much, we are way too attached to our political opinions and not willing to listen to what God might have to say. And if you think I'm by that in endorsing anything in particular, no, nope, not even going there. Just want to make sure we keep our willingness. Have to be willing to hear what God wants. Detached from our possessions. If God says, I need you to leave this stuff behind, can you do it? Um, I get to clean out every three years, whether I like it or not. Um, and it's getting easier. Um, but to look and say, I, I've carried, I told Pam right before this, uh, yesterday I opened a tub that I had not opened, I'm convinced, in 10 years, which means it has gone through four moves with me. Why? And I look at that, the one thing in there that I really want is my reception in the church certificate from 2001. So I'm glad I found that one. I did, I've been wondering for 10 years where it was, and now I know. Um, but the rest of that, you know, and so many other things, you know, books, I'm a really good book hoarder. So thank you all for taking them away from me. If I had so much stuff, I'd say, Bishop, you can't move because I got too much stuff. That's a problem. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you don't have as much as Father Schultz. I don't have as many deer heads and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Practice, silence, and peace. I know I've talked about this before, too. We live in a really noisy society. Um, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I'll say this. When you're driving somewhere, can you actually have your radio off? Yes. Are you able to do that? We, yes. Some people can. They really can. Just the silence will drive them nuts. Um, I'm not judging you, but really seriously not judging you, but it might be something you at least want to try, like for the next five miles, next five minutes, and turn the sound off and go into it. Um, all the noise deadens us. You guys know the story of Elijah on the mountaintop? He's uh, been chased out of Israel, and God meets him on the mountaintop and says, I will meet you, and there's an earthquake and a strong wind and a fire, and God is not in any of them. He's in the, our translation, I don't like small whisperings of sound, is it one still small voice is a much better word for it. God's in the quiet. If we're making too much noise, if we surround ourselves with too much noise, it's very, very difficult to hear. Him. Examine the movements of your hearts. He's overlapping. I don't think he actually quoted Ignatius at this, but examine the movement of your heart. When you're being pulled one way or another, see what's pulling you. And is it a good pull or a bad pull? Um, especially with major things, you need a spiritual director. I am not a terribly good spiritual director, I don't think. Um, <laughs> but it's important for priests to have one at least, and for people discerning. And if you can find one, that's wonderful. A spiritual director needs to be someone who is actually, my first spiritual director said, it's more important to be wise than to be holy. And there's something to that. You want both. Um, certainly more important to be wise than to know theology backwards and forwards. A spiritual director can help you see what God is working in your life in ways that you might not notice. How do you find one? I mean, they're hard to come by. They're hard to come by. Yeah, they're hard by. To come by. Yeah, far away. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I went twice, yeah. this is many years ago, and was very disappointed. I didn't think I got the spirit, any spiritual direction. And yeah, and some, sometimes a perfectly uh, really good spiritual director is not for you. Um, <laughs> so, not for you. I don't mean to be very old. I just mean in general. That could be for all of you. Sorry. I, I just don't know where you find them, and you ask yeah. about them, and people are like, no, I don't you know. You might start with the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
It is a little easier for priests and seminarians to find spiritual directors because we need them more than you do. Sorry, but that's the honest reality of it. So priests will carve out more time. Um, sometimes consecrated religious can make good spiritual directors too. Um, go to St. Minor, ask if there's anybody. That's what I, I just was down there, and it yeah. turns out that they do have that available. And I, I that, would, that would be a good place to That would probably be yeah. there. How, how long does it take to get that? She was asking about St. Mine, right? How far Four is that? Four hours and 15 minutes from my house. So it's like a big... It's in, down retreat. toward the southern tip of Indiana. Personal retreat. What? It is right next door to Santa Claus, by the way. <laughs> the town? Mm -hmm. Santa Claus, Indiana. Santa Claus, Indiana. So this is the key question everybody's been waiting for all evening. So how do you know if this inspiration is actually from God? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I, I, I can unload all my stories on you now because I don't have to hold them back. Um, <laughs> Deacon, I think Jerry Johnson was his name, uh, was a few years ahead of me in seminary from someplace out west, and he used to be a livestock farmer. And he had sheep, and there was one ram that just loved to butt him whenever it got the opportunity. And he'd hear his voice and line up to do it. And so one day, he put the ram here and fence post here. And he stood and turned, and the ram came after him. And he stepped away, and the ram slammed four head first into the post and never did that to him again. <laughs> now my sheep know my voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're in places where they raise sheep, you, know, you can see this very often in the Middle East. You have two herds with their flocks, and their flocks will pass, and they will sort themselves out on the other side because they know the voice of their shepherd. So what we're trying to do is know the voice of our shepherd, um, but we have to work on learning it. One thing we know for sure, God does not contradict himself. So if you think your inspiration is telling you something, but it's against scripture, not an inspiration. If it's going against the teaching of the church, it's not in the good spirit. If you've made a committed vocation, um, if... The, I hear the Spirit telling me to abandon the priesthood. I know guys do even sometimes they're right, but I have to at least look at that one very, 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 very carefully. If the Lord is saying, abandon your family, um, abandon never. There have been situations, uh, St. Jane Francis Jan Chantal springs to mind. Um, she was a widow with several children, and she was called into religious life, but she had to make provision for her children first. You have to fulfill your commitments. The Lord will never call you away from commitments that you have made. Or at the very, very least, you need to look at that very, 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 very carefully. Um, you also know by its fruit. And this is the tricky thing, is that you can only actually work this in retrospect. Say you do something, and you think you're following an inspiration, and it fails horribly. Does that mean it was not an inspiration? What you have to say is, am I at peace with the decision I made? Um, if it produces peace, joy, communion, and humility, even if it wasn't inspiration, by the way, big deal. You got something good out of it, right? Something truly good. Um, sometimes when people are, I did, talked about this, I think, way back when I talked about apparitions. Sometimes when people have a false apparition, but if it's leading them not toward pride, which is what the devil would want out of it, but toward humility and service, big deal. The devil, poof, you got something good out of it. But you want to know, um, looking back, okay, divine inspirations establish us in peace, are not changeable, and impress on us a sense of humility. Humility is the one thing the devil does not know how to fake. He can fake the rest of it, but he simply does not understand humility. Um, what you want to do, and I don't think I did a slide on this, um, God will usually work with you in a consistent way. Some people receive inspirations in prayer. Some people receive inspirations while reading the scriptures. Some of us are really slow-witted, and so God has to send people actually to speak to us, sometimes several times. That's how I wound up in seminaries. Several people had to tell me about it. But you can begin to pick up, and God's always free to do it however he wants, but he generally will work with you in a similar pattern. So if you say, well, I heard inspirations in prayer, and I went out and did them, and they produce peace, joy, communion, humility. You're learning what your master's voice, RCA, you know, the little dog standing by the, please tell me someone who remembers that. Oh, yeah. I do. 
Thank you. I feel better now. Um, that you were beginning mm -hmm. to know your master's voice. Only in retrospect can you really figure that out. By looking and saying, yes, I followed that, and even if it didn't work, I'm at peace with what I did. You're learning to hear your master's voice. Some people will think, oh, God's will is always the most difficult thing. If it's easy, it can't be God. No, 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 no. God wants the maximum of love in whatever he calls you to, but that doesn't necessarily mean the maximum of suffering. Um, with any vocation, I did I talk about this Sunday? I really need a new assignment because I can't remember what I said to people anymore. Um, any vocation involves suffering. It's just part of the deal. Um, but we are not, God does not want masochists. It's not like the more we suffer, the happier God is, necessarily. Some people God does call to lives of really intense suffering. But in general, if you think, well, this is the hardest thing, so that must be what God wants me to do. No, it doesn't work that way. When I was first uh, considering going to seminary uh, was in the summer of 2001, and we all know what happened in the fall of 2001. And so I thought, well, maybe... Maybe the Lord wants me to wants me to go be a missionary in Afghanistan and help convert the people there. And I was scared to death of it. And that was that was de textbook desolation, textbook maximum suffering. And I didn't. For fortunately, I was able to just like, oh, we're not going there. We're not going there. I should have talked to a spiritual director about that. Um, but it's but the hardest choice. Sem was seminary an easy choice? No. But it wasn't the maximum hard choice. It was just the choice that I thought God wanted me to make. It's the most most loving choice I knew how to make for him. Don't sweat the small stuff. I can talk about what you wear. It's actually not that big a deal. You count small change the way you would big chunks of gold. Yeah. If your change count comes off by 25 cents, it's no big deal. Okay. So if we were like, I gotta get this every little bit of my life right in accordance with the inspiration of God, God actually gave you <laughs> intelligence and reason for a reason. Most of the time, we just need to think about what's the best thing to do in this situation. What am I going to have for tonight? Whatever Jimmy makes me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, but things like that, you know, if you're saying, well, I'm going to eat high on the hog while people around me are starving, okay, that's a little thing. But the choice of reasonable menus is no big deal. Don't sweat the small stuff. Live your life in a reasonable way, wanting to do what God, I want to want what God wants. And just be confident if you're actually heading in the wrong direction, he'll get your attention. If it's something out of the ordinary, like pressing three on the elevator when it was going to go to the ground floor, it seems reasonable. It's compatible with your obligations. <coughs> if we really think it's the voice of Jesus, which I misspelled, sorry, Lord, um, and having learned over time what Jesus sounds like in my life, and if we feel more at peace, the more we say, yeah, I'll do this, go ahead and do it. What's it going to hurt? Even if it's not an inspiration, it's reasonable, it's compatible, you're trying to do what God wants, you're at peace, do it. Then apply that retroactive test and say, well, wait, was that the voice of Jesus? Was it not? Bigger things, and touched on that one earlier too, consult with the wise. Um, do like uh, in diac information, in seminary, in uh, religious life, you have to have a spiritual director. I mean, just no question about it. Um, priests should. I do, but I'm way overdue calling mine, so I need to make an appointment a little bit more. You just need someone who can help you work with these things because sometimes it can be obvious to somebody else or fairly obvious to somebody else what's going on in your life and we're just too stubborn to see it or too hard to see it. So before you do something really big and drastic, find somebody wise and get their advice. That's the last slide. Do you mean answer my question? No, your question. So it'll be our question. Yeah, your question. Rephrase it. <laughs> rephrase it for me, please, so I make sure I'm right, answering the right one. Okay. Also, so I can eat something. So, <laughs> there are times that I feel like I'm just, I'm, I call it like I think I feel like I'm in darkness. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I want to come to church. I go to, I go to church. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I say my prayers mm -hmm. and stuff. But I'm just like empty. Mm -hmm. Um. Those at home, I have my mouth full, so I'm stalling for time. Um, 
those are called nights of the soul. There are big ones, um, but we have little ones along the way. I think of it as God is taking the training wheels off. A lot of times, especially if you go through some sort of conversion experience, like, wow, God is great. <coughs> I love praying. <coughs> and I'm going to knock all this sin out of my life. Well, several slides ago, we know it's not going to happen. Um, and, uh, but God wants us to follow him, not because of our feelings about it, not because it's easy, not because we enjoy prayer, but because we know it's something we need to do. Um, motivated by love of him. Even if you're feeling dry. If you feel like this is, why am I doing this? Why am I saying my office when it's the same psalms I've been praying for the past 15 years? Because I love God. And this is something I promised I would do for someone that I love. And so you might say you're just going through the motions. No, you're saying, Lord, <coughs> think of all the other things I would rather be doing. And I'm here instead. I would rather give you a gift than, <coughs> oh, wow, I feel really great about this. But that has to come from God. He himself has to give you the grace to do that. He's mm -hmm. the one who's giving you the grace to keep praying even though you don't feel like it. Say, Lord, can I have some other grace? And you can ask for that. You can say, Lord, I'd really love to you know, uh, be more enthusiastic about my prayer. Up to him. Our job, most of actually growth in spiritual life is simply a matter of showing up. How we advance and when we advance is up to the Lord. We have to keep showing up and asking, actually, that's an indispensable part of it. Say, Lord, you know, at the appropriate time, move me up. Keep me advancing. But we really just, no matter how we feel about it, because your feelings don't matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm picking on Pam because I can. I only have a few weeks left to do these things. Yeah. I have to pick on all of you. Um, we're, we're, regardless of how we feel about it, we're going to follow the Lord. Even down, it seemed to be, a, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. We walk through those dark uh, valleys. The two big ones, by the way, people talk about are dark night of the senses and dark night of the soul. Dark night of the senses is when, way back in the early slide, we think we love things in the world only for their uh, being in God. And so God takes away our enjoyment of everything else. Everything you used to do seems like I'm talking to depression, and I think it's actually uh, something that can happen with depression. It can be that purging process. Is nothing seems enjoyable to me anymore. Um, I wonder if chemo didn't do that too, because they also was on steroids and who knows what else. And I had the attention span of a gnat, <laughs> <laughs> and so nothing was enjoyable. But that helped detach. So it's that big, and you can come. And when you come out of it, at the Lord's own time, you enjoy things, but you are able to enjoy them much more in their proper context. So that goes along for a while, and we say, and feel. In reality, it is true. We feel, oh, I'm really close to God, and then God says, I don't care about your feelings, and that's called the dark night of the soul. And at that point, like I was talking about, St. Therese toward her death. Although I think it was a different state of affairs, but the person feels like God has abandoned them, like their prayers of no value. They might well be damned. Maybe their whole life has been a waste. And it is basically a naked act of faith to continue. So God, so, so, God, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. so God wants the person to set aside, I'm not relying on my own strength anymore. I'm not relying on my own abilities, on my own wisdom, on my own anything, and cast myself totally on you because I know that's the truth no matter how I feel about it. Yeah, Marilyn, go ahead. So it, it really is desolation. How you mm -hmm. respond to it mm -hmm. is, but yeah. it, it's not really any different than True, yeah, it's a major severe desolation. Yeah, Yeah. so it's just your, how you choose to respond. And, and both of them are purifying movements because what happens is that we are trying to purify ourselves from attachment to earthly things and we simply can't do it, not entirely. And so at a certain point, God reaches in and says, you can't do this, but I can do it for you. And so we lose that attraction for earthly things until we learn to re-put them, put them into their proper context. Um, we that come to sense. Yeah? yeah. It says now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we can become, uh, I'm not sure how does exactly the word, um, but just too close to God is not the right sense. But in some way or another, we can become too reliant on our own faith and on our own abilities 
uh, to be close to God. And so he has to take all this away and say, if I take away everything that you think is supporting you, will you still be faithful? Like Job. Jo Job? Or no, not like Job. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Job is one or the other, um, I don't know which I would say he is. I could. He took everything away. He took everything away. That would be the first dark night. But then his companions are testing him with the second night, but I don't think he ever gives in to it. So this is kind of a little bit off, but um, so I have a family member that I'd like to know, how do you help somebody who's chronically suffering, like uh, a younger person, mm -hmm. for two years at least mm -hmm. or more uh, with physical issues that, I mean, she can just sit home and cry all day mm -hmm. and she's forced to go to work because she ran out of sick days. So, um, but out of pain, she just, I mean, I try to send her encouraging things I get from Mass or whatever, but um, she she just feels totally just going to, yeah, I mean, like there's no hope, and she's pretty young, has young family, so mm -hmm. it's really hard, but I don't know how to help her. This, I pray for her, but there's like no nugget that brings her consolation. It's a, it's a physical, it's completely yeah. physical. Why, why in the province of God he allows it for, I have no idea. It is an opportunity for her to grow holy, um, but she'd rather have another one, and I completely get that. Um, yeah. Just keep, keep praying for her. And you can pray that the Lord sends her light and consolation. It's a very good thing to do. It doesn't let her get depressed. Scar down. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sabidi. I'm so proud. Oh, wait, I'm not so proud. <laughs> yeah, I think you and Janine need to compare knees yeah. after. <laughs> I better have a race. <laughs> no, I win that one. <laughs> no race is allowed. I, I'm kick timing them both to see which one yeah. kneels first. So just so you know, she's, right. no she's pressure, on the, but that's what I'm I, 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 I will years, tell though. you, the doctor, I said, I can just about do everything except kneel. He said, you're not supposed to kneel. My two knee replacements, but yeah. he did say that was. I'm getting it. Yeah. <laughs> but, Mine said it could. So yeah, I sit. I, we yeah. sit at church. But um, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't kneel. I say, you notice I don't genuflect much. Uh, yeah. Questions, yeah. questions yeah. are back on topic. Anybody quick okay. before we close it off here? About knees. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kneeling, kneeling. Oh, and even it bugs me that I can't genuflect because my idea of me of perfection is the guy who can genuflect. But if that is something the Lord has pretty much taken from me, yeah. then I need not to argue with him. I'd save a few genu genuflections so I can do them on Christmas and the Annunciation and Corpus Christi, and that's about it. Well, Holy Thursday. John Paul did too towards the end of his life he had people help him mm -hmm. you know he had two on each side that would help him kneel but it was only on special yeah. I don't think if I've been in a service big enough to do that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I will thank you people at home thank bye. you bye